She witnessed a murder. And just as I got there, he fell. And the victim was her own father. And the life I had always known died right along with it. How this woman escaped the pain of her past. That's just a testament to how great God is. Plus, get the surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar, and why these silent killers are destroying your brain. All that and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Lawmakers in several states are pushing legislation aimed at making Bible literacy classes available in public schools. And President Donald Trump voiced his support on social media. President Trump tweeted, numerous states introducing Bible literacy classes, giving students the option of studying the Bible. Starting to make a turn back? Great. A growing number of United States states are introducing bills that would allow more students in public high schools to study the Bible. There are proposals in at least six states that would offer classes on the Bible's literary and historical significance. The legislation has drawn objections from groups seeking to protect, uh, supposedly protect, the separation of church and state. The groups argue that the bills are backdoor attempts to promote Christianity in public schools. And they're actually trying to revisit history and say, well, this has never existed in American history. Yeah. And they're dead wrong. Uh, all of the readers uh, that people learned how to read and write with, mm -hmm. uh, all were based on the Bible yeah. and all had scriptures on the Bible. Here's something that amazing happened to me in my life. I, I lived in Manila for five years and had the pleasure of going to some of their public schools all of which were started by American missionaries. Huh. Uh, and this is, you're going back 120 years and they're ab absolutely revealed. It was single women uh, from America who were school teachers that said, I want to devote my life to teaching English and teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic in the novel Philippines. Thought. <laughs> and they went and devoted their lives to those children. And you can see the legacy. In the public schools in the Philippines, you have Bible verses up on the walls. Unbelievable. Uh, their memorization, it's mm -hmm. all about how can I be a good citizen? How can I do things the Bible way? And well, when, it, it actually works. When I was in school, public high school, the principal used to come on over the loudspeaker every morning and we started the day with prayer. And everybody prayed along. Well. I did too. Me too. Um, yeah, even even after the Supreme Court said it was illegal, yeah. so, I don't know why they were doing it, but they did it. And uh, then on top of it, there was a reading from the Bible, yeah. uh, and usually Old Testament, but uh, a reading from the Bible. And those who didn't want to pray were allowed to be silent. Just and, be silent, exactly. Um, but everybody yeah. in those days wasn't offended by how someone blows their nose, you know, <laughs> which is kind of the culture we're living in and, today. And uh, to add to it, there have been some psychological studies that have come out of Israel, and th they were done by uh, psychologists who uh, weren't believers, uh, were Jewish, but weren't believers. And they were amazed at the results. The results are, if you read the Ten Commandments uh, and then take a test, uh, or you know, they would have these morality tests that would follow, uh, you would be a lot more honest, uh, a lot more what we'd expect uh, if you first have read the Ten, Ten Commandments. If you're not exposed to them, uh, curiously, you're more likely to be dishonest. And so that's, a, that's an interesting thing. You can see that. That's a TED Talk, and it's worth watching. <laughs> Well, he's appeared in several popular movies and television series over the past several years. But even with his success, actor Neil McDonough found out that taking a stand as a Christian in Hollywood can cost you. In a recent interview, Neil revealed that his no love scenes policy cost him a role on the ABC primetime series Scoundrels. He said no to doing sex scenes since he is married and was labeled as a religious zealot in Hollywood. The role cost him over a million dollars and other future roles. Well, Neil says, I put God and family first and me second. That's what I live by. It was hard for a few years. I won't kiss any other woman because these lips are meant for one woman. Uh, wow. Way to go, Neil. That, wow. Yeah. Where, where do you hear that anymore? <laughs> you don't hear that at all <laughs> anymore. Uh, yeah. but well, especially, here we are hearing it. And so, and hearing it in Hollywood of all places. And someone says, for me, mm -hmm. uh, my belief is more important than the money. Yeah. You know, I, we hear so much lately, and in a sense, this is a good thing. Stand up and be counted. You know, say, 
You have to pay a price for that sometimes, but how wonderful that in that culture, which is so heavily bent the other way, that this guy stood up and said, this well, I think is who there's I hope. I, you know, let, let's have hope. Let's bend it the other way and say, yeah, okay. Uh, yay. <laughs> well, here's another story about bending it the other way. The owner of a Columbia, South Carolina seafood restaurant shared a message of forgiveness over social media after he decided not to press charges against the man who broke into his restaurant. Mr. Seafood Restaurant was robbed earlier this month, so neighbors worked together to help identify the man seen stealing from the business in the surveillance video. The owner, Kevin Scott, says God inspired him to talk to the man before calling the police. He learned that the man did it to feed his family. The man apologized and offered to work to pay off what he stole. Kevin decided not to press charges and posted a photo of the two of them on Facebook saying, forgiveness is better. And yes, it is. Wow. Forgiveness is better. Life is a whole lot better when you don't live it bitter. Uh, and it's so easy to say when we're right and that it needs, we need to have justice. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to hold on to that. Uh, but then you dig into the story and you find out, well, there was a genuine need here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right, let's forgive, let's restore, and let's lift one another up. That's a wonderful thing. It was a great, you know, really, it was, I'm sure it was such an intense moment for this man to take three deep breaths and care to talk to this individual and find out what was going on is pretty remarkable. Yeah. Hats off to you. <laughs> Well, Rene Martinez was once one of the most notorious men in Florida. The founder of a gang, he spread fear and violence on the streets of Miami. A life-changing encounter now has him bringing hope to communities he once terrorized. Take a look. Life in Leisure City, Florida was anything but easy for young Rene Level Martinez. I grew up, you know, without a dad. My mom was in the streets. My mom was into the Santeria, which is witch, like a form of witchcraft sacrificed an animal all over me as a kid, and uh, I started seeing demons. They haunted me my whole life. At age 12, that darkness led to a life of crime, with Level breaking into homes, stealing guns, and getting involved in drive-by shootings. In 1990, he started a gang known as the Latin Syndicates. We had uh, almost like 300 members, and feds was investigating us. Uh, half of my homies are in, jail, uh, in prison, half of them are dead. Level recalls staring death in the face numerous times. I remember the time the, bullet, the gun jammed in my face. I remember the time the bullet grazed my head. The other time the bullet whistled by my ear. The times I was, I was running through the backyard and they were shooting at me. All the times I got shot at. All the times I was half dead, but I was still alive. Life changed somewhat after Level became a dad. In an attempt to better provide for his family, he pursued bare knuckle fighting and mixed martial arts. I became a professional fighter as my journey went on in life. I was always good at fighting. I started fighting bare knuckle with Kimbo Slice. I was, I was beating everybody bare knuckle. We were betting money in the backyards, bare knuckle. I'm winning. My name got so big that Telemundo came and they did a, they offered me a pro contract. I went to Nicaragua, beat three-time world champion Ricardo Mayorga. Yet those successes in the ring didn't fill the void he felt inside. I had the money, I had the fame. I was doing the gangster music, but I was empty inside. By this time, his mother had become a Christian and began praying for her son. In 2016, her prayers were answered when Level had a supernatural experience with God. It's like he showed me my whole life in a matter of like five seconds. And I just got on my knees, I started crying out to God. And when he spoke to me, I knew that if I didn't surrender, I felt like I was gonna die. I am here in a community that was once terrorized by Rene Level Martinez as the head of the Latin Syndicate's gang. Today, Level is back here, but with a very different message. So it's been like two and a half years since that day. And I, since that day, I've been going to prison, the project, to, to the juvenile facilities, to the, to the schools for a different reason. I came back to the streets I used to terrorize, but now I'm giving them, the, the, I'm giving them life now. Yeah. Giving him Jesus, do you feel me? Before it was death, now I'm giving him Jesus. Level now ministers to former gang members and is often seen baptizing people in some of the city's roughest neighborhoods. Tell them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. And that's, my, that, that's what I preach. I almost died on many different occasions, but for some reason, I'm still here. 
Meanwhile, a documentary called The Warrior Level has been made about Level's life. Churches are using it as an evangelistic tool, and according to the former gang leader, lives are being transformed. When a lot of people come to Christ because of my testimony, and, and I'm just honored to be used by God. It's a privilege and an honor to be used by him, you know, because he could have chosen anybody else. I could have been one of, them, one, of, one of them people that died early, but I'm still here, and I'm grateful. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Leisure City, Florida. Uh, it just goes to show you can never be too dead for a resurrection. Yes. You can never go too far. Uh, yeah, God always wants to take people back home. And you know what I love about that is, it, and you see this in the lives of believers, God takes what the enemy meant for evil, the thing that was pulling you down, and turns it around and makes it valuable. I mean, it's so amazing. It's the miracle of salvation. You know? <laughs> it's awesome. Well, coming up, could the meds being used to treat Alzheimer's actually be making the problem worse? And can you reduce your chances of developing brain disease? Neurologist David Perlmutter will share some groundbreaking research right after this. Millions of Americans take medication to treat their Alzheimer's disease. The problem is the very drugs that are being prescribed are actually associated with a more aggressive decline in cognitive function. Our next guest says you can keep your brain healthy and reduce your risk of brain disease by choosing to make some lifestyle changes. Take a look. Five years ago, neurologist Dr. David Perlmutter launched a global phenomenon with the release of his best-selling book, Grain Brain. Since then, he's helped millions improve their health and fight against dementia and neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, all without drugs. Dr. Perlmutter says it's time to take control of your health. With his fully revised version of Grain Brain, he offers the latest nutritional and neurological updates so we can have a healthy, disease-free brain for life. Here with me now is Dr. David Perlmutter, and we thank you for joining us. I am delighted. This, we've, we've talked about your first book, Grain Brain, but this one is, has an update of what the progress in the last five years? It is. What, what's happened here is we have five years of validation that mm -hmm. the notion of eating a high-carb diet uh, is threatening to the brain and that we should really emphasize exercise, making sure our sleep is restorative, cutting our carbs, and eating, dare I say, more dietary fat. Mm -hmm. Who knew? Talk a little bit, if you will, about Alzheimer's meds, because you say in the book that they're actually a fraud. You know, it, it's, it's striking uh, that we have in America 5.4 million uh, Alzheimer's patients, many if not most of whom are taking the medications that doctors have prescribed in November of 2018 in the Journal of the American Medical Association was an article published by a researcher, Dr. Richard Kennedy, uh, where he analyzed the studies on these drugs and found that in fact, not only do the common Alzheimer's drugs not work, but they speed the cognitive decline. It's like uh, giving a diabetic a, a pill that's gonna raise their blood sugar, it makes no sense. And you know, it, it, people put their faith in their doctors to do the right thing, and we really wanna practice under the notion of above all, do no harm. We've got to call it out. It's peer-reviewed science. And, you know, I'm grateful that we have this opportunity to share that information with people. So have you seen a transition since that information came out in the journal? Have you seen a change in these things being prescribed for people? Or are we so caught up in this is all we know how to do that it just keeps on? Unfortunately, it's the latter. And uh, my, my feeling was that article, that research, which was wonderfully conducted, uh, should have been on the evening news, should have been at the yes. beginning of the evening news and the front page of all of our major newspapers. And yet people still want to hold on to the notion that you can live your life however you choose and that there's a magic pill solution for all of your problems. Yeah. As it relates to Alzheimer's, that doesn't exist. I want to make one thing uh, very clear. If there were a treatment for Alzheimer's that worked, I would absolutely embrace it. Uh, not only would I have used it with my patients, but for my own father as well. Absolutely. I, I highly value the researchers who are trying to find a cure for this situation. But as yet, we don't have an answer for that. And what's more compelling is 
we know that it is by and large preventable in the first place. Mm -hmm. So talk from that perspective, because I think people who are watching us are saying, well, what can I do? To, well, part of the issue is inflammation. So what are the greatest stimulators of inflammation that can be avoided? It's a really excellent lead in question because uh, we've got to understand that this process of inflammation is not just the cornerstone of Alzheimer's, yeah. but Parkinson's coronary arteries, diabetes, and even some forms of cancer. So it's really in our best interest to reduce inflammation by reducing our consumption of sugar, making sure our diets are not threatening to our gut bacteria, mm -hmm. getting more aerobic exercising, eating more good dietary fat, and importantly, recognizing how important dietary fiber is to nurture the gut bacteria. These are actually not that challenging steps. It's just implementation that, that has to happen. Well, it's kind of what you said a moment ago. We can't go through life taking one pill to solve every problem, and we can't go through it just eating everything and anything that we want without having repercussions from that. Talk, if you will, for a moment about some of the warning signs of brain disease, because you also say that a lot of the um, cause of it starts 30 years before we're actually in it. So. What yes, so uh, there's been a push over the years to determine the earliest signs of Alzheimer's so that we can do mm -hmm. something. Well, what are you going to do? You don't have a treatment. Yeah. So uh, when you begin to have cognitive issues, you're forgetful, don't know where you put things, go to uh, a place, don't remember why, where are my keys? But your point is extremely important, and that is we sow the seeds for Alzheimer's in terms of our lifestyle choices in our 20s and in our 30s so that this important information about reducing inflammation happens to be the same information about weight loss, happens to be the heart smart diet, the diet that improves the immune system. It's all the same. It's not as if there's one life plan that's good for your heart but bad for your brain. Mm -hmm. It's all the same because they're all united in this one mechanism of inflammation. So you're killing three birds with one stone or more, <laughs> even. When I think you're nurturing. Nurturing. Uh, yeah, I, I want to <laughs> focus on Lyme candle, but you know the point is, it's these are lifestyle changes that can't wait mm -hmm. until we don't know where we put our keys. Well, let me ask you this: If someone has not applied all of these things in the early years of their life, and then they get to the place where some of the signs you're just mentioning happen, is it reversible? It is, and that's what's really quite remarkable. Uh, you've had, uh, at least on the 700 Club, uh, a very close friend of mine, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's published a book about this. And he has a new book coming out really detailing the individual patients and how they've improved. Uh, I had the opportunity to write the foreword to that book, and I'm really, I feel very blessed by that opportunity because he's taken a different approach that it isn't a magic bullet, but rather, it's a buckshot approach. I don't know if you know what buckshot yeah, I is. Do. There you go. <laughs> I do. Uh, and that is you have to leverage multiple uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, diet. Yes, uh, uh, lifestyle issues related to sleep, related to exercise, reducing exposure toxins, improving vitamin D status, to name just a few. Mm -hmm. But in so doing, he's been able actually, and uh, in published research, reverse this disease. Now, you know, to apply that to a large population is going to be compelling. My mission is to spread the word. John Kennedy said, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we've got to uh, leverage in terms of preventing this very disease the treatment for which is very, very challenging. Well, that's the message we wanted to get to you today. If you want to learn more and there's much more to learn, David's bestseller, Grain Brain, has been completely updated. You don't want to miss this. You can pick up a copy wherever books are sold. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Terry. You Good to see you again. You too. You bring a wealth of information. Thank Gordon? You. Still to come, her father was murdered right in front of her eyes. A very troubled family member came into our family home and severely injured my mom and shot my father. My whole world was just turned upside down that day. Hear how she found hope after tragedy when we come back. Doris Walker witnessed her father's murder. Every time she thought about it, she smoked pot to forget. And soon that habit turned into a full-blown addiction. I remember screaming, and I ran over to my dad, and just as I got there, he fell. And my, my whole world was just turned upside down that day. When Doris Walker was just 12, her father was murdered in front of her. 
a very troubled family member came into our family home and severely injured my mom and shot my father. And the life I had always known died right along with him. I began to live in denial. No matter how hard I try, I cannot get this vision out of my mind. I just had to play it out as though he was out of town and he'll be back soon. And I knew he wasn't coming back, but that was the only way I could halfway get through it. Dora spent years trying to come to terms with her father's death. My dad was my hero. He actually was. He taught me so much about the Word of God. He taught me about music. So he would sing. He sang in the choir. My dad was a farmer. And he'd come home at night and he would be so tired, but he was never too tired to put us on his knee and talk to us. Doris accepted Christ as a young girl and sang in her church choir. But after her father's death, she began to numb her emotional pain with marijuana. Every time I would think about this, dreaded scene where he fell on the ground, I would smoke marijuana. And I began to smoke it more and more, and then my body began to crave it. And by the time I was an adult, I had a full-blown cocaine addiction. Doris left her home and family in the small town of White House, Tennessee, and began living on the streets of Nashville. She did whatever it took to survive, including prostitution. It didn't start right away. At first, I would just sit around other women, and they would go out and get money and come back. And I'm thinking, well, that must have been easy. One time, I tried it, and I made it through it. And I thought, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. And I trade myself to get out of the cold, blistering weather. And I trade myself to get out of the hot sun. Doris was arrested numerous times, but it had no effect on her. My life was full of going to jail and getting out of jail and selling myself as though I was some type of a commodity to support my habit. And I was actually in my addiction for over 26 years. When Doris would return home for short periods of time, her family and friends would pray for her. It's almost as if her countenance had just, had just fallen, but you could just tell that the insides were, were, were hurting. For a brief period, Doris got married, but she returned to the streets when the marriage fell apart. I had a husband and two children, and for a while I was able to hold it all together. And then finally it just fell apart because I just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, my, my addiction progressed. I left him because he was an alcoholic. And lo and behold, that's when my life really fell apart. The next two decades were a vicious cycle of addiction and incarceration. One day, her mother invited her back to a reunion at her old church. She said, Doris, can you do something for me? She said, we're having an anniversary at our church, and we need you to come on back home and sing some of the songs that your dad taught me. Could you do that for me before I die? And one morning, I could hear my mom. She was praying so fiercely that you could almost feel the vibrations coming from her. And she's singing, and she's praying with all her mouth. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. And she's praying, God, don't let my daughter go back to the street. So I do what I came to do. I go to the choir rehearsal. I go to the choir in I sing and I praise. So I was just on a spiritual high that night and I thought, oh my God, there's another kind of high. I don't have to sell myself and I don't have to induce drugs because my body is the temple of God. Shortly after that, Doris ran into her old friend Regina, who told her about a place called Magdalene House, which ministers to women caught in the web of the sex trade and addiction. She said, we got a place for you and you can come on in. So November the 9th, 2009, I got my life back. I got to go into the Magdalene program, and they took care of me. They sent me to the dentist. They sent me to therapy. They taught me the, how to live life on life turns without the use of drugs and alcohol. And I got my relationship back with God. And I remember how to pray again. So I get high on the Word of God and on the Spirit of God, and it's just like, it's breathtaking. And I breathe it in. I, haven't had, I hadn't had a drug or a drink of liquor in nine whole years. And that's just a testament to how great God is. If people can just see the faithfulness of the Lord just by, by, just by hearing her story, it's all worth it because the Lord is faithful. What looked like a mess, what looked like there is no way that this is gonna get resolved, the Lord resolved it, and He resolved it in a mighty way, a mighty way. Through Magdalene House and their sister organization, Thistle Farms, Doris began a new life. Doris was eventually hired by Thistle Farms, where she now works as an ambassador for the organization and as a sales consultant. We help women all across the globe 
and I get to stand in front of people and tell my life story. And I get to let women know that are in addiction that God is able, no matter what you're going through in life. I don't care if it's your health, if it's cancer, if it's a mental illness, if it's addiction, no matter what it is, God is able. He has brought me out. He has given me a new life. He has given me my voice back. I'm able to tell people that no matter what, it's going to be okay. I'm not saying that I'm never going to have problems again. That's okay. Because when you got God on your side, when Jesus is standing there beckoning you, saying, come on home, it's going to be okay. Jesus is beckoning for you, and he's beckoning right now for you to come on home. All you have to do is say yes. And here's Doris. She's gone a long way, hasn't she? She saw something horrible when she was young. It traumatized her. Uh, she found refuge in taking drugs and, and said, oh, this, this allows me to forget. And, and that, that first thing, it just seemed good. And it seemed like, okay, well, this is making me feel better. This is making me feel uh, okay. And I can forget what happened to my father. And then like so many others, you start taking the drugs and then the drugs take you. Uh, and you go to places that you never thought you would go. You do things you never thought you would do. But I've got great news for you. God wants to set you free. And it's been his story of redemption since the beginning. He always is looking to make a way for you to come home. For Doris, the key was, I recovered. I got my relationship back with God. You can do that. All you have to do is ask him. If you want help with that prayer, we're here for you. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to tell you God loves you and he wants you to come home. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalms. Truly, my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. God bless. We'll see you again.